OK, so the Center for Environment, uh, Integrative Environmental Health Science and Department of Pharmacology and Toxicology welcomes you to our Environmental Health Science Series seminar. So I'm going to introduce our speaker. So we have Dr. Matt Cave. He's a MD in the Department of Medicine. He got his MD at the University of Kentucky. He did a residency at Washington University and then a fellowship at the University of Louisville. He's a distinguished university scholar and he has a recipient of an R35 and he's going to talk about environmental liver disease. Thank you. All right, great. So this is uh, my first in-person uh, seminar, so I can't figure out whether to keep the mask on or not. Um, I'm up here, but I guess for the sake of people here, I'll leave it on. Um, uh, so um, Jamie Young was initially scheduled to, to give this talk, and she's uh, 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 actually had a good talk prepared, you know, in preparation anyway. But uh, she's very busy uh, working on her D, was it DP four five DP five five award, and so I. Uh, uh, offered to, to substitute so she could focus on that. Um, and this is a, a, a edited, you know, variation of a talk I gave to the McLean group, uh, but there are a few new things put in there because I know that uh, at least Jamie had told me that uh, her talk was also going to be related somewhat to the cancer rig too. So I've added a little bit of cancer stuff uh, to that talk as well as some new, new data. So um, starting with the case presentation, uh, many of you all have seen this before. This is uh, Paul Coder, who's one of my clinic patients. And his story was published in uh, Discover magazine. So he's a retired Marine veteran with Nash cirrhosis. He was exposed to VOCs in drinking water at Camp Lejeune in North Carolina during the 1970s. He has uh, risk factors for liver disease. He has Nash and cirrhosis. And those metabolic risk factors include diabetes and obesity. Interestingly, Paul had a family history of chemical exposure and cirrhosis, uh, and his brother, who worked at Rubber Town in the vinyl chloride plant, and uh, actually took care of his brother, and he died of liver cancer uh, trying to get a liver transplant. And so Paul's question is, what was the contribution of the exposures to the liver disease in him and his brother, you know, and obviously concerned that he could get liver cancer himself. Uh, like his brother, and there's a little picture of Camp Lejeune uh, here. It's in southern North Carolina on the coast. So historical uh, perspective in uh, liver disease, emphasizing some of the events that happened here in Louisville. Um, but uh, uh, environmental liver disease is not new, and uh, many people uh, are aware of aflatoxin which is uh, formed by mold that can cause liver cancer. And it's a particularly big problem in China. Um, I visited China a couple of years ago um, and uh, at West China University, they have uh, just this one hospital over several thousand cases of liver cancer presenting every year, say or carcinoma. Uh, but it was initially described Aflatoxin, a lot of people may not be aware, it was initially described in turkeys. Aflatoxin toxicity was in the feed and it was called turkey X disease in Britain in the 1960s. And then uh, I'll talk a little bit more later about this tumor. So this was a, a sentinel event in uh, occupational health. Yes? Dr. Kay, can you talk a little bit about the online people are Trouble? Okay. Yeah, I might do that too. <laughs> All right. The people in the front row, since I just got back from Florida, might want to scoot back. <laughs> uh, but I'll talk closer in the microphone. So uh, this is an important sentinel event in, uh, in uh, occupational health uh, in 1974 from here in, in Louisville. So I think this is the type of question that could come up on the uh, toxicology board exam, uh, which I've not taken, so I don't know for sure, but this is an important sentinel event where uh, uh, about 30 plant workers now have developed this rare liver cancer called hepatic hemangiosarcoma. They had vinyl chloride exposures, um, and this was discovered here in Louisville, Kentucky, in Rubbertown in the mid-1970s. 
and there were some other poisoning events along the way. A lot of these are uh, could be considered poisoning events because the exposures were very, very high, even for the plant workers. And here's a plant worker that I cared for that has a uh, CAT scan of a liver here. And this big circle is the liver cancer, the angiosarcoma. So his liver's almost completely replaced uh, by that tumor. Um, and then in 2010, um, Dr. McLean and others and I uh, uh, coined this term toxic and associated steatohepatitis to describe fatty liver that also occurred in some of the uh, rubber town chemical workers. Uh, so Louisville has been central you know, to a long-standing uh, history in this problem. Um, so there was a uh, clinical uh, guideline published within the last year or two by the European Association for the Study of Liver Diseases on uh, occupational uh, health and liver disease. And so I included this because it has a nice table. So what are the different pathologic lesions uh, that one can have with uh, uh, occupational exposures to the liver? And so uh, there's different types of acute damage and chronic damage. Uh, and so I'm going to be talking about some of the ones that are circled, um, cholestasis, uh, toxic and associated fatty liver disease, which was, you know, really, really rewarding to me. So this was a term that, you know, we coined here in Louisville about a decade ago, and now it's already uh, coming into clinical guidelines for medicine. So that was really uh, rewarding. I'm not quite sure the data justify its inclusion yet, but uh, nonetheless, it was very rewarding that it was. Um, liver fibrosis, and we've already talked about some of the liver cancers that one can have. And so these are what the pathologic lesions look like. And here are some selected uh, chemicals. Um, we're funded not by NIOSH, but by NIEHS. And so we're looking at environmental health. And uh, many of these same lesions and chemicals seem to occur and be important with environmental exposures. But I think the occupational uh, health literature uh, still provides a, a good starting place uh, because uh, it's a more you know, relatively controlled environment in terms of exposures. And it also may mimic high exposure. So um, uh, and dose response obviously is important. And so we want to capture high doses as well as low. <clears throat> and so uh, this is what the uh, toxicant associated steatohepatitis uh, looks like pathologically. It's important to note that fatty liver um, occurs commonly from a lot of different exposures. And so the liver, um, the biochemistry is exceedingly complex, but the pathology isn't. And so no matter what uh, an exposure is, oftentimes it leads to fatty liver. And so it can be an exposure to alcohol, alcoholic liver disease, can be exposure to high fat diet or high fructose diet. Um, uh, non-alcoholic fatty liver disease, or it can be exposure to chemical. Uh, in all these cases, the pathology looks the same. There's fat droplets here in the liver, um, and then uh, there can be superimposed inflammation. There's the little blue cells, inflammatory infiltrate. That's the itis, hepatitis, liver inflammation. And then this is a ring of collagen, cirrhosis, and then uh, liver cancer, hepatocellular carcinoma. Uh, which is the most common form of liver cancer. And now the reality is, of course, that uh, it's very hard to have a clearly defined pure case of these things anymore, right? And so uh, the prevalence of overweight and obesity is, I think, around 70% combined now. And so you don't have a lean chemical worker or a lean alcoholic as commonly as you used to. And so the more common situation is someone that uh, you know, may weigh too much, they may drink a little too much on the weekend, and, you know, they walk across the street and get exposed to pollution, or maybe it's in their food that they eat. And so the multiple things coming at once. All right, and so I'm going to be talking about uh, Taffled and TASH today, and then also a little bit about uh, cancers and, uh, and uh, hepatocellular carcinoma, and then some of the cholestatic uh, liver disease. And with the fatty liver disease, I'll be talking about some key hypotheses in the field, uh, nutritional interactions, some receptor-based modes of action, and uh, liver is a mediator of systemic uh, disease. 
And so we just got uh, some great data back, which Tyler's looking at from uh, our buddies at the EPA, just uh, showing a new mechanism for that. And then uh, developmental origins of health and disease, which is really frightening. Uh, but uh, at a simple level, this is a, a cartoon of a hepatocyte. And so the hallmark feature of fatty liver is too many fat droplets in the liver. And so fat can either be made in the liver, it can be burned in the liver or oxidized. It can be imported out of the bloodstream into the liver uh, and it could be elaborated or secreted into the bloodstream as a VLDL particles. And so uh, at each of these steps, there's been environmental pollutants uh, that have been described that can impact those. And so several different ways that pollutants can cause fatty liver. Um, and so what are the chemicals that have been associated uh, with fatty liver disease? This is a, a partial list, but uh, pretty much whatever class of chemical you're interested in, you know, if it's a co common one and it's high on the substance priority list, there's a good chance that uh, it might be uh, uh, implicated in liver disease at this point in at least some papers, uh, either laboratory animals or epi. Uh, and so uh, um, here's the priority uh, rank. So uh, arsenic with uh, uh, Dr. States in the room is number one on the priority list, and it's been associated with fatty liver um, uh, and uh, many other common chemicals. And so some of the ones in red I'll uh, talk about, uh, you know, as we go on. So my laboratory doesn't focus really on any one chemical. We focus more on the disease uh, process. Um, and so we described this fatty liver disease and, and TASH um, in uh, 2010, but uh, it was really described well before that. And so this is one of my favorite uh, discoveries that I made just digging through boxes. So it happened twice. So when I was a trainee here, I found this old box of slides from liver biopsies of the chemical workers. And then we, they were being biopsied as a cancer screening project to see if they had hemangiosarcoma because they didn't have CAT scan in 1974, 75. So they got a random biopsy to see if they would randomly hit the, hit the cancer if they had it. And a liver biopsy gives you one, uh, I think it's 50,000th or maybe it's 500,000th of the liver volume. Uh, and so the odds are really low. You're just going to randomly hit it unless it was this worker with this giant one. Uh, and so anyway, these were saved and I uh, found that box and looked at it. And while the cancers are what got everyone's attention, what was actually more common was the fatty liver disease. And so I thought I was very smart as a trainee to, to realize that. And then a couple of years ago, I uh, found this letter here from Hans Popper, who's the greatest liver pathologist of all time, probably. Uh, we have a Hans Popper Memorial Lecture every year at our liver meeting. And so Hans Popper uh, had reviewed some of these slides for T Carlo Tamburo, who was a hepatologist here that collected them and, uh, and wrote that letter back to uh, Dr. Tamburo about these slides. And uh, uh, the term non-alcoholic fatty liver disease wasn't described until the, uh, or coined until the early 1980s, but he already, in uh, um, 1979 said that these livers have uh, fatty liver hepatitis and he says he cannot exclude alcoholic liver injury. Uh, these workers at least reported that they were non-drinkers but uh, Tim or Popper goes on to say if this is firmly excluded I would consider toxic injury and so uh, Hans Popper basically described toxic and associated steatohepatitis uh, when I was uh, five years old and so as smart as you think you are, sometimes these uh, older guys and uh, investigators, giants in the field, uh, you know, it's really humbling to know that they, you know, had these thoughts uh, many, many years ago. The point is, uh, the main point I'd like to make for trainees that are on the call is that sometimes, you know, don't discount the work that you do during your, you know, as a trainee. So, you know, keep an open mind. I found this old box and opened it up and looked at it under the microscope and it completely changed my life. And so uh, we all do important work and sometimes our biggest discoveries can happen at times that we don't expect it. So these are what some of these slides look like. Fat droplets, a lot of inflammation, a lot of uh, fibrosis. 
And so uh, this uh, 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 cohort had 84% of that box of slides had fatty liver and up to 55% had fibrosis. And so these are higher prevalences of inflammation and fibrosis than one would expect even in a bariatric surgery cohort. Uh, but these uh, workers were not obese. And so there were several um, markers associated with hepatocyte death, antioxidant depletion, insulin resistance, and adipocytokine abnormalities associated with these lesions in the affected workers. And again, you know, we've gone from discovery to practice guideline on that. And then more recently, this work has been extended to environmental health, not only here in our super fund, which I'll show you a little bit of data for, but uh, other groups now have measured uh, urine vinyl chloride exposure biomarkers and residents that live near chemical plants and have found that uh, these urinary vinyl chloride exposure biomarkers were associated with uh, uh, liver disease, both in kids and adults. Um, and so they're taking it from the plant out into the environment. Those studies were in Taiwan. So here's some data that, uh, uh, that are uh, currently uh, being written up by uh, uh, Tyler uh, Gripshover and uh, Van Rita Wolong in support of uh, uh, Project One of Superfund. Uh, some of the leaders of that project are here. And so this was a, a cross-sectional study of a, a cohort uh, with uh, VOC exposures, a residential cohort here in Louisville. And so we determined uh, cross-sectional confounder adjusted associations for uh, liver disease biomarkers and VOC exposures. Vinyl chloride is a VOC. Um, and uh, uh, these there were 15 urine metabolites of 11 VOCs. And so this was uh, broken down into uh, uh, non-smokers uh, versus smokers. Now, the uh, most striking result, which I'll show here, is that the alkaline phosphatase levels uh, were uh, increased uh, with uh, exposures to eight different VOC metabolites. But interestingly, they were only uh, increased in the smokers, but not the non-smokers. And so we're trying to figure out what that is. Is there something in the smoke like cadmium that's doing it and not the VOC, or is, the, is there a threshold dose a VOC exposure be required to get this elevation um, because the smokers have higher VOC levels than the non-smokers. So uh, uh, this is a new example uh, for CIEHS of a lifestyle exposure interaction with uh, VOCs and liver toxicity only occurring in smokers for whatever reason. So I never would have guessed smoking. We always think alcohol, but uh, uh, Dr. States is very wise uh, beyond his time on this theme of lifestyle interaction. <clears throat> and so uh, our laboratory's approach is to uh, make observations in patients and then uh, create animal models. And so uh, Juliana uh, uh, Bayer uh, had generated or developed the animal model of vinyl chloride exposure with high fat diet with or without vinyl chloride. And she saw that more fatty liver, which are the red droplets uh, with the high fat diet. And so uh, um, uh, her group and ours have, uh, and others have found uh, you know, many mechanisms uh, by which the vinyl chloride can cause this liver toxicity and fatty liver. And uh, most of these are concordant with the uh, human studies. And so you can see a list of them here. I'm going to talk a little bit about diabetes and this uh, cancer and upcoming slides. Uh, but our uh, CIEHS uh, uh, EAB member, Yvonne Rusin, uh, just cited a lot of our work in this uh, manuscript that's just been uh, accepted to hepatology. I think it's in, uh, either in press or recently published on uh, key molecular concepts or characteristics, I think they call it, key characteristics of hepatotoxicity. And so the concept is, is are there any uh, a compound, are there any factors associated with that compound that could predict, enable one to predict liver toxicity? And so this would be important, you know, for drug companies because they don't want to develop a compound that has liver toxicity, and it can be important for environmental health. And so I think they described about uh, uh, 15 characteristics and uh, vinyl chloride was listed as a as a uh, you know poster child of liver toxicity because it hit many of these so it hit uh, one seven 
you know, 12, 5, et cetera, et cetera. And these are things like altered lipid metabolism, metabolic activation to reactive intermediate. So it's nothing that you wouldn't necessarily expect. Uh, but uh, this is an example of, uh, you know, uh, one of our CIEHS EAB members being familiar with their work and uh, citing it in publications, you know, pushing the field uh, forward. Um, and so uh, not only is liver important, uh, you know, for liver's sake, it also is a mediator of systemic disease, uh, such as atherosclerosis and possibly even diabetes. And so these are some new data we've recently generated with collaborators at EPA in support of Superfund Project 2, looking at mouse proteomics from the same uh, uh, vinyl chloride exposed mice here, either fed a low fat or high fat diet. These were chronic exposures, 12 weeks at a, a very low dose, uh, low sugar levels. And so uh, we've got a manuscript that we're writing now on these data. And so there's vinyl chloride exposures or high fat diet exposures, but uh, there's abnormalities in signaling molecules, uh, uh, IGF-1, adiponectin, and TNF in these pancrea, pancreata, I guess pancreases, um, that uh, trans, you know, transduce down into altered intracellular signaling. Now, importantly, IGF-1 is made by the liver. So this is a liver producing something that's interacting, cross-talking with pancreas. Adiponectin usually comes from adipose, but uh, also can be is generated in pancreas, which I wasn't aware of until uh, until they sent me these data, and then TNF. And so uh, uh, anyway, there's altered signal transduction and then impaired uh, AKT phosphorylation. And so AKT phosphorylation is very important for uh, uh, release of insulin for beta cells. And so you can see in the low fat diet, there was actually hyperphosphorylation of AKT, which would be generally protective against uh, diabetes because the pancreas can secrete more insulin. But uh, with a high fat diet, uh, there's a different effect. So the uh, phospho AKT is not only not induced by the vinyl chloride, if anything, it's lower. I mean, there wasn't significant because this was so so low, but it's basically absent in the high fat diet mouth. So there's a, a, a diet exposure interaction. And again, this is an example of intraorgan crosstalk where IGF-1 coming from liver can impact uh, pancreatic function and uh, diabetes. So liver is a cause and effect. So just to be talking, all right. Closer, people can't hear me. Okay. Ah, there we go. Okay, so uh, this is a manuscript uh, on the hemangiosarcoma patients from our biorepository or subjects. Um, they were workers at the BF Goodrich plant. Um, here's a picture of what angiosarcoma looks like. It's a uh, tumor of sinusoidal endothelial cells, so you can see the cancer is trying to make little blood vessels. This is a well differentiated one. And so uh, this is uh, uh, John Guardiola, who was a uh, 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 career U of L uh, student, went to undergrad here, and then did a post back at uh, e uh, NIEHS intramural after graduating honors program at U of L. Came back and did medical school and uh, uh, made it up to chief internal medicine resident. And now he's a trainee at uh, Indiana NGI. In Here's his father, who's a pulmonologist at the VA. And so we're hoping to bring John back. But uh, anyway, he uh, was first author on this pap paper that just came out uh, looking at uh, uh, serum metabolomics uh, in the uh, workers that either had cancer or were uh, had subsequently developed cancer uh, from our, our biorepository. So the vinyl chloride induced angiosarcomas are supposed to be a genotoxic uh, mode of action for cancer, but we found uh, alterations in many different metabolites. And the reason we did this is, you know, I'm not a cancer biologist, but I'm very aware of some of the work of uh, Dr. Miller and Jason Chesney and others looking at metabolic activity of cancers. And so this cancer is no exception. And we see, uh, you know, many metabolites uh, that are involved with metabolism or inflammation. Uh, such an example would be bile acids uh, here that were different in the uh, impacted workers. And possibly some of these could be used as biomarkers that would be better than a uh, uh, random liver biopsy to screen for this tumor and at-risk workers. 
So um, a lot of this work on the fatty liver disease falls in the line of endocrine disruption, endocrine disrupting chemicals, as I just showed with the diabetes, uh, pancreas proteomics data. And so that field has developed really over the last 25 or 30 years into endocrine disruption. Uh, Bruce Blumberg here coined the term obesogen. So there's chemicals that can make you fat. And then uh, I coined this term TASH, which are basically the same thing, it's just the liver. So chemicals that make the liver fat instead of chemicals that make the adipose fatter. But it's basically the same concept. And then Jerry Heindel, who was my first program officer, has kind of integrated them into this metabolism disrupting hypothesis, stating that environmental chemicals have the ability to promote metabolic changes that can result in diabetes type, uh, type two, uh, diabetes, obesity, or fatty liver. So this just provides some context from the, for the work that we're doing. And so again, we have a bench to bedside approach and with the R35, you know, we have collaborators at multiple places, including NIEHS. And again, our approach is to uh, screen, uh, use epi studies as a screen to identify chemicals that are associated with liver disease, because such a list, like as I showed earlier on with chemicals that are associated with fatty liver, such a, that list didn't exist 10 years ago. And, we still don't know what all the chemicals are. And so we screen using uh, existing cohorts and new cohorts to find associations. These are usually cross-sectional studies, and then we develop animal models. But we got to work for some neat cohorts like Deepwater Horizon, and then the C8 cohort uh, that was in this movie, Dark Waters uh, from uh, Parker's, well, actually near Parkersburg, West Virginia, uh, Rubber Town. And then I'll talk a little later about the uh, Aniston Community Health Survey and Alabama. And so some of these studies have showed uh, uh, polychlorinated biphenyls as exposures associated with uh, suspected non-alcoholic fatty liver disease. So this was initially done in NHANES and by a group in 2010 showing uh, uh, increased odds ratios for having the disease that correspond with exposure quartile. And then we validated these findings in this Aniston Community Health Survey, which is a cohort of residential subjects that live near the chemical plant that made the PCBs. And so we found that, uh, and there's uh, 209 theoretical PCB congeners, 35 were measured in the blood here. And we found that these were associated with biomarkers of liver injury and uh, inflammation, but also inversely associated with insulin and leptin. So kind of similar to that vinyl chloride study that the exposure may cause fatty liver, but may also be causing some pancreas uh, and pancreatic insufficiency and diabetes there too. And uh, this was interesting to us because Monsanto said that uh, in their MSDS that the uh, first toxicity you see with uh, uh, PCB exposures is uh, liver injury. And so if Monsanto says that there's a problem with one of their, uh, or said, I guess they're no longer in existence, if they said they had a problem with one of their uh, um, chemicals, then you can probably believe it. But nobody looked at liver much and until uh, uh, Banrito Wong showed up uh, as my first graduate student and she developed uh, these animal models similar to that vinyl chloride model where she gives a control or high fat diet with or without a PCB exposure. And you see this liver just filling up with uh, fat, uh, the red droplets, uh, but only in the high fat diet exposed mice, which got obese. So this was an obesogen, this particular uh, uh, PCB. And so uh, she and others in our group have done a lot of work uh, dissecting the mechanisms uh, by which these PCBs do that. I'm not going to go into all the details. I will hit a few few of the highlights uh, as we go along. But uh, you know, a key concept that we've seen over and over again is this diet interaction. So there was a slide with vinyl chloride exposed mice where at that dose the vinyl did nothing unless there was a high fat diet. And then the last slide with the PCB showed the same thing. And so why is there this nutritional interaction? This is again another you know, lifestyle exposure theme. Uh, consistent with their CIEHS objectives. And so there's been over the last year, year or so a lot of uh, publications that explain some of these nutritional interactions in the liver disease. And so this one was very simple uh, in that uh, uh, PCBs are lipid soluble. And so if you have a fatty liver, you get more PCBs distributing into the liver just by nature of the solubility. Uh, but this was uh, done by the Iowa Superfund group, and they took a unique approach through this uh, 
a P450 reductase knockout mouse. And so that was uh, necessary because that mouse gets fatty liver but doesn't get obesity. And so, you know, if you were looking at how lipids change the distribution, if you had increased adipose mass and increased lipid mass, uh, it would be, you know, a little harder to pull out other than just increased lipids in one compartment versus the other. And so that's the unique approach that they took. And so uh, they also showed that the females tended to have a little bit higher PCB levels too. And uh, Van Reed is now showing some sex differences with PCB toxicity related to uh, sex in males versus females. So it could be due to just simple differences in where these things bioaccumulate with obesity or with different sex. Um, and so Angie Slitz group has been studying the PFAS compounds at the Rhode Island Superfund Center. And so, uh, you know, these are very hot compounds now in environmental health. They look like they cause uh, fatty liver in humans and certainly hepatocytes and in some um, animal models, but not all. And so paradoxically, uh, she's had some challenges where uh, with a high fat diet, the PFAS she thought would have made it worse, but actually was protective against the PFAS. And so what she's discovered is that there's, uh, in contrast to many other compounds like PCBs, there's actually an active transporter from PFAS to get it into the liver. And that transporter is dysregulated by the uh, high fat diet. And so not only does the PFAS not get in, it's the, these OATPs. Uh, so these are downregulated by the high fat diet. And so the um, liver, apparently she thinks the liver thinks that the PFAS compounds, which look like free fatty acids, the liver thinks they're free fatty acids. And so it starts trying to pull them in with free fatty acid transporters like uh, CD36, for example. And so uh, they're getting tied up with the bringing the compound in. So they're bringing less fatty acid into the liver and so you can get uh, not only lower PFAS levels in the liver, but also lower fatty acid levels because they start competing for the same transporters. So uh, very complicated. And, and Tyler uh, here has been working on that in an animal model. And if uh, Angie thinks high fat diet wipes out these transporters, you know, look what alcohol does in an alcoholic liver disease plus PFAS model, it completely uh, obliterates them. Um, and we've also seen some interactions with uh, metals in the literature this year. And so uh, 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 in this study, TCD induced uh, NAF, and this was from the Frank Gonzalez group. So dioxin is a classic uh, you know, toxicant and it's associated with fatty liver disease. Um, and uh, uh, Frank says the mechanism can possibly be entirely due to dysregulation of this lysosomal copper transporter which causes a uh, uh, intracellular copper deficiency. And they, they had some uh, approaches to show that if they could you know, protect against this, they could totally protect against the, uh, the fatty liver due to TCDD. And so there looks like there may be a pop metal interaction in hepatotoxicity. And it's not environmental metals, it's endogenous metals. And interestingly, this SLC46A was uh, one of only seven conserved targets across uh, 14 diverse mouse strains. So these are data from the that are brand new from the Michigan Superfund group or Michigan State Superfund group. So it's not a collaborative cross model, but it's 14 strains. They expose them all to TCDD and they do RNA seq. So it's a ton of work. And there's only seven genes that are conserved across all of those models, but this copper transporter is one of them. So this could be important. And then in our work, we've seen. Uh, other types of metal transporters that are impacted by PCBs, like iron transporters, for example, or iron proteins. And so there probably is a new uh, emerging, a new interaction between pops and metals that would be interesting to consider. Um, Josiah Hardesty in our group has been studying uh, signaling disruption. And I think this is an important concept regarding uh, receptor interactions with environmental pollutants. And so, you know, a classic example from the last slide of dioxin, you know, the receptor for that is the aryl hydrocarbon receptor. It's a potent agonist of that receptor. Uh, but Josiah has been studying the uh, epidermal growth factor in his dissertation work. And so um, epidermal growth factor is uh, a key receptor that we target for cancer chemotherapy. There's about 30 epidermal growth factor receptor inhibitors, 20 or 30 that are on the market. Uh, 
uh, for many cancers, uh, I think first developed for lung cancer. And so, uh, but we don't think about it in terms of liver, but uh, um, hepatocytes abundantly express this. And if you give radio labeled epidermal growth factor uh, in the blood to a mouse, apparently most of it actually traffics to the liver. And so there were some publications where people had looked at epidermal growth factor phosphorylation following PCB poisoning events in humans, and uh, uh, it was uh, reduced. And so the question is, is could the uh, PCBs be a uh, uh, antagonist of epidermal growth factor receptor? And interestingly, they, uh, uh, PCBs are also known to be indirect CAR activators like phenobarbital. So here's phenobarbital. And so the uh, mode of uh, action of, uh, of phenobarbital's indirect CAR activation, it's also indirect CAR activator, is by EGF inhibition. And so, uh, or EGFR inhibition. And so Josiah developed a uh, cell-based uh, screening assay uh, looking at the uh, ability of a cell to, a liver cell to uptake radio, well, it was fluorescently labeled epidermal growth factor. And so it kind of had almost like a binding curve but he found that uh, many of these environmental pollutants, and particularly the PCBs, had uh, very high potency to inhibit this internalization of the uh, labeled compound at basically femtomolar potency. So incredibly potent, and uh, there were putative binding sites on the receptor that was uh, done on some docking simulations. Now, over the past year, um, this has, I think, gotten really hot, or could get really hot, because um, not only do PCBs do it, he showed that uh, atrazine does it, uh, chlordane does it, uh, so pesticides do it, and then there have been new things in the literature where the bisphenols do it, bisphenol acid. You, this is not surprising because structurally these things are all similar in size and in some case very similar in structure. So this could be a, a conserved uh, mechanism in environmental health. And so we've uh, just published a paper in EHP where uh, Josiah was able to uh, treat. So we think it's a competitive antagonist, and so he was trying to overcome that uh, by giving exogenous EGF. And so it's a complicated story, and I'm not going to get into it all, but uh, giving the EGF to PCB-treated mice could uh, resolve some, but not all, of the liver toxicity associated with EGF. So I think this is uh, at least a proof of concept that this may be an important uh, mechanism in environmental liver disease and one that's likely to be conserved across many different uh, types of chemicals. So on to the really scary stuff. So this is the uh, single most important paper I think that's ever been published in environmental liver disease that came out uh, uh, last fall. And this was a uh, developmental origins paper. So this was a uh, a cohort from Europe that had uh, mothers that had blood drawn during pregnancy. They had babies, they followed up the, the, the babies, and then they went back and measured PFASs in the blood of the pregnant moms that had been archived and see if there was correlation with uh, fatty liver disease in the kids. And look, sure enough, there was. And so not only that, um, they did metabolomics in the children and the maternal blood levels of the PFAS, here's a PFOA, PFNA, they were associated with different metabolites, just showing that the, there was a pers persistent me metabolic disruption associated with uh, uh, gestational exposures to PFAS, uh, which was associated with the development of liver disease later in life. And then uh, Cheryl Walker presented these data at Research Louisville a couple of years ago that are now presented that were very similar developmental exposures associated with fatty liver and actually liver cancer in male mice. So this is really scary stuff, We've shown it in an animal model with this uh, Organa 10 and then in humans. Uh, uh, but the concept that, you know, this epidemic of liver disease, uh, which uh, we're in right now, um, uh, may be related in part to things that are uh, ancestors were exposed to in the past that we may not be able to do anything about, um, may or may not, that remains to be seen. So very scary stuff. Um, so we're going to come back to cancer a little bit. And so in that Aniston cohort that had the PCB exposures that I'd mentioned earlier, um, we've uh, got this paper under review at EHP, well, it was returned for some revisions, and I think they're going to accept it. But we measured microRNAs, circulating microRNAs in the blood, and uh, of these uh, 
uh, subjects, about seven or 800 of them. And we're looking to see if any of the mirrors, uh, there were about 70 measured, were associated with some of our regular liver toxicity biomarkers or the exposure biomarkers. And we found that there were, and there were some of these that overlapped across all of them, um, such as the mirror 122, 192, and 99. Uh, but the approach that we, reason we did this approach is because with these cross-sectional studies, you don't have a liver biopsy. You can't do, you know, sticking people, you know, randomly in the liver, you know, in residential studies. Uh, but we can generate, use that uh, omics approaches in informatics to generate a liquid tissue biopsy by taking high throughput biomarkers like mirrors. And so we did that, these mirrors that were associated with PCBs, when we do tissue, generate tissue biopsies using IPA, they're predictive of kidney injury, liver injury, including cirrhosis and liver cancer, and then the heart disease, cardiac uh, fibrosis. So I think this was a neat approach um, potentially for the future, but then when you do networks of these uh, uh, PCB associated mirrors, the central to the network is uh, P53. Um, and so it's uh, you know probably not surprising there that there have been some uh, uh, reports that uh, of cancer and PCB uh, exposures. And so we've actually seen this in our own lab. Our model's usually 12 weeks, but now we're going longer to about 30 weeks. And we do that, we get cancer, hepatocellular cancer in our mice. And there's been recent uh, publications of, uh, I think some of these are listed down here below, but uh, cohort studies showing that PCB exposures are associated with hepatocellular carcinoma development. So we've been studying the steatohepatitis, but I think if you go farther, you'll see start seeing liver cancer, and same with vinyl chloride. And so these data, I think, are coming out hopefully in a new journal called Environmental Epigenetics, which is a really neat new journal with a great editorial board. And these are data generated from Carrie Kling from some of our PCB-exposed mice looking at the epitranscriptome. And so that's known to be important for uh, liver disease and for liver cancer as well, and other types of cancer. And so this is something I wasn't aware of until a couple of years ago, but just like DNA can be methylated and modified, so can RNA. And so that, and whether or not it's modified will determine if it's uh, degraded or transla uh, translated into protein. And so we were able to show that uh, different PCBs uh, exposures were associated with uh, uh, changes to the epitranscriptome at a global level. And so I think these are uh, certainly the first data uh, that I'm aware of for uh, liver and an environmental pollutant and epitranscriptomic changes. And so now we're generating more mice with cancer. And so we're going to go back and we have plans with uh, Dr. Kling to go back in these uh, can mice with cancer to see if uh, epitranscriptome changes uh, and specifically targeting the M6A modifications uh, here uh, are uh, involved possibly with liver cancer uh, related to PCB exposure. So uh, let me uh, go on to this. I wanted to just show some other new methods that are being developed by others, geospatial methods uh, for liver environmental liver disease. So geospatial methods are not uncommon, but they're being, you know, newly being applied to, to liver disease. And so this is uh, the disease called primary biliary cirrhosis, not polychlorinated biphenyls, but it's a cholestatic liver disease. And so this was a cohort from the UK where they determined that uh, uh, living near a coal mine contributed 39% of one's risk to developing this uh, autoimmune liver disease. And a lot of that risk was due to cadmium exposure coming from the mines. So new data coming from geospatial imaging. And then also new data coming from World Trade Center cohorts, so DR2 research, disaster response research. So I wasn't aware of this until I was contacted by Andrea Branch, who I'm helping to advise on a new NIOSH grant that she just got. But they have a World Trade Center cohort at Mount Sinai, and they're getting screened for lung cancer. And so she found on CAT scans of the lungs, if you go down to the liver, you can diagnose fatty liver by CAT scan. And so she's found that there was an increased prevalence of uh, fatty liver in the World Trade Center first responders. And the, this paper is just out. It was really cool. There's actually a dose response 
And so the dose response depends on when you went to arrived at the World Trade Center. So if you went on 9-11, you had a higher risk of having fatty liver than if you went 9-12 or 9-13, 9-14, or if you went in October or November. So there's a, it's an unusual type of dose response, but it, nonetheless, it's a dose response. And, and this is scary too, because these scat, CAT scans were done like a decade later or more after the responders went. So it's a persistent effect. Uh, and even more frighteningly, there's a cohort of about 3,000 people. She told me that there's now over 20 liver cancers reported in that cohort, hepatocellular and cholangio. Um, and so many groups now are using this approach where they're taking and not, and so I've been talking about an approach of epi studies where you use environmental exposure cohorts that already have environmental exposure assessments, and then we add liver biomarkers on now. But now investigators like Ruhit uh, uh, Lumba and Marion Voss, who, tra who trained here, or that are clinicians, are taking well-characterized fatty liver cohorts and adding exposure assessment to them. And so Rohit showed an association with Roundup and uh, severity of fatty liver disease. And uh, uh, Dr. Voss and others have showed, uh, again, an uh, uh, association between biopsy-proven fatty liver disease and PFAS exposures, the severity of the disease. So the developmental cohort didn't have biopsies. This one did. And so uh, uh, that's a new approach. And then so we've been taking that approach now through this uh, uh, P30 to P30 interaction grant with uh, Dean Jones and the Emory uh, uh, P30, the Hercules Exposomic Center. And so we have liver uh, biomarkers that are done by elastography, which is a machine here, which determines the amount of liver fat or liver fibrosis. And so we took patients uh, from a biorepository from IU uh, that are in a NAFLD clinic and have uh, well-characterized non-alcoholic fatty liver disease. And then uh, we've done metabolomics and plasma and exposomics to see what exposures might be associated with the fatty liver and are there any, any metabolic pathways associated with the severity of fatty liver disease and a cross-sectional approach. And so the two biomarkers you get from that fiber scan machine are liver stiffness, which is fibrosis biomarker, and then uh, liver steatosis, which is this CAP uh, biomarker. And when you take the metabolites associated, turning up. There. Okay, must be a short. Um, when uh, you take the metabolites associated with these biomarkers and do pathway analysis, interestingly enough, for both steatosis and fibrosis, you get linoleic acid metabolism. And then when you do the uh, exposome-wide association studies, you can uh, uh, find some chemicals in the blood that were associated with the severity of uh, liver fibrosis. And the uh, one that stood out was uh, fluorine, which is a PAH here. And so um, there it is here on the, the dot on the uh, uh, Manhattan plot. And then uh, when you pull out the fluorine and then you do a metabolite-wide association study versus fluorine, you get a heat map that looks uh, like this. So here's fluorine levels, and then here's your heat map. But then when you do the pathway analysis here, you also see linoleic acid metabolism being impacted. And so fluorine increases fibrosis, or is associated with fibrosis, increased fibrosis. And so if it, the association was one of causality, Maybe it did that by impacting the linoleic acid metabolism, which is also associated with fibrosis. Um, and then uh, this was really wild. This was an exposure called methamyl, which is a, uh, a carbamate insecticide that was uh, present in all 150 of these subjects. And it's supposedly a limited use uh, insecticide, but all of the exposed subjects had it and it, look at how many metabolites it was associated with. It was associated with uh, the one's methamyl levels uh, in these NAFLD cohort. They all had NAFLD, but the methamyl levels in that cohort in the blood were associated with something like 10,000 out of 12,000 metabolites. And that's with a false discovery rate of less than 0 0.5. So this was 95% certainty that 10,000 out of 12,000 metabolites are associated with methamyl, which is in fly paper. And then when you see here, the methamyl levels mapped on a heat map down here, 
once you get to a dose here, your metabolome completely shifts. There's only two patterns. And the top pathway impacted by that exposure is again linoleic acid metabolism. So we're going to be doing more work on that. So for sake of time, I'm coming to an end, so I'll wrap up. But you know, when I give this talk for clinicians, they always ask, well, what can we tell our patients? You know, so maybe we believe you that the environment is playing a role in liver disease. What in the, how do we find out if it is playing a role in our patient? Well, it's tough because you know, when a patient walks into clinic, I don't have a box that says expose them that I can order. Uh, so it's tough. And then also I don't have a medicine, even if we had an expose them box and it came back said methamyls through the roof, what am I gonna do about the methamyl? There's no methamyl medicine. Uh, but uh, Rob Sargis and uh, Jerry Heindel have written a couple good papers of just general common sense on how to, uh, re you know, steps one can take to reduce their exposures to endocrine and metabolic disrupting chemicals, such as you know organic foods, um, you know if one can afford them and things of that nature. Um, and so I'd refer people onto that for more information. So back to the case presentation from Paul Coder. Um, there is now federal legislation protecting veterans uh, like Paul who were exposed that have liver disease, and uh, there have been epi studies published by ATSDR now showing a higher prevalence of liver cancer in Camp Lejeune versus Camp Pendleton uh, um, uh, servicemen who were stationed at the Lejeune's the East Coast Marine Base, Pendleton, of course, the West Coast Marine Base. And so there is uh, health benefits for veterans and families exposed that have these conditions, one of these conditions that have been linked through an Institute of Medicine report to the exposure, and they can also even request uh, compensation for that. So we talked about TAFLD and TASH and uh, laboratories moving increasingly into uh, hepatocellular carcinoma with the help of a lot of others. Uh, because that's, you know, again, I'm not a cancer biologist, uh, but also other types of liver disease like cholestasis. So here's some pictures of my family, wife and kids and uh, my sister. And she's got horses and some of the students that uh, have really done this work along the way. And uh, Russ Pro down at his farm uh, for daffodil viewing earlier in the year. He has fields and fields of daffodils. So, um, uh, We'll wrap up there and be happy to take any questions. And I apologize for microphone, I guess. Not that it was my fault. <laughs> Maybe I wasn't close enough. Any questions? Thank you. <laughs> Factor states. So I was intrigued by that association of smoking. Mm -hmm. um, so smoking induces people to have the Yeah, so I'll have to go back and look. I, I know that several of them are CYP2E1 substrates, but I don't know about CYP1A substrates. It's uh, very possible. Uh, but uh, thank you for bringing that up. We're working on the discussion now, so we need uh, potential explanations uh, for this observation. So that will be one that we can include now. So thank you. Uh, and so, I love that. Have you thought about where you use the exposure chains. Yeah, so that would be a good future direction. So we haven't uh, considered that. In fact, these these smoking data uh, have just just came back within the last month, mm -hmm. and so we haven't had much time to think about it. Um, but uh, that would be a good future direction, and then. Uh, We've also found a uh, similar metabolomic signature to the methamyl with a peak that we think is uh, uh, benzoic acid. Uh, they, they're having trouble validating that peak. It's probably due to uh, what uh, metal is conjugated to it. Um, it was read as copper benzoate, but it's not. But uh, to make a long story short, that's in e-cigarettes like crazy too. And that's just another thing like methamyl that's associated with almost every metabolite in circulation. Um, and so I think these e-cigarette flavor, flavorings and preservatives that we don't normally think about in liver disease, as well as smoking, 
you know, would be good future directions that, you know, we have unique resources here with the tobacco center that we can investigate. Dr. Gay, when you uh, answer questions in the room, can you please repeat the questions so people can hear you online? Thank you. I guess I got Checking for online questions. No sound, no sound, no sound. <laughs> Change headphones, I can hear it now. <laughs> Dan Conklin, please repeat the questions. Okay. So Dan, I'm glad you're on. You and I'll have to talk about smoking and whatever is down the road. <laughs> Absolutely. So, Matt, can you hear me? Yes. OK, I, I wanted to ask a kind of a general question. One, I think you're connecting the clinical studies, which was very impressive uh, number of studies going back to Tamboro and and all the way through um, current ones with the liver diseases. Fantastic. And then there were several cases where you provided you know, animal models that that we can look at mechanisms and and plausibility uh, of the relationships. Um, one of the questions that always comes up for our toxicologists, and this is really for you to kind of convey your your thoughts about when we try to connect the dots between animal models and and human uh, studies. What kind of dosing do you find is necessary in in animals to achieve kind of that concordance that uh, Julianne Byer showed in in her paper? Because often we hear that is that dose relevant to human exposures, and and you really described a number of studies that may give give you the best perspective on this idea, at least yeah. with the, some of these compounds? So that's a great question, Dan. And so what I believe personally is the the um, going to be the best way to do these kind of reverse translational studies is to use, um, no matter what your disease of interest in is, is to use uh, archived samples that were collected in randomized double blind placebo controlled studies with longitudinal follow up because with a cross sectional study approach like we've been doing you cannot prove causality because it's a one time measurement but if say you're studying you know look you get a medicine for a heart failure clinical trial and they've you know archived blood and you've got serial echoes going out two or three years you know in multiple time points you can do an exposome analysis at multiple time points, and you can do a metabolomics analysis at multiple time points, and you can see, you know, if your dose and wet dose at time zero is associated with uh, worsening heart function over time. And so I think that's going to be incredibly cost effective, and we're going to do that approach um, with uh, Dean Jones with a NASH medication clinical trial to see if it works. Uh, but there's absolutely no way you can cost effectively enroll, you know, big numbers of patients with uh, serial invasive tests on them, uh, you know, in the context of an NIEHS R01. But if you can access materials that are previously collected by other NIH studies or by drug companies, you can uh, see, like in the methamyl study, there was one methamyl dose where everything flipped on the metabolome. And so what is that dose and can we recapitulate that in the mice? So that's kind of answering two questions. How do you find the dose? And then the question was, you know, how do you prove causality, you know, in an epi study? And so we can do the mouse models and find the right biomarkers to measure, you know, in the epi study. But I think in order to prove that the, the, the causality, you know, we want to link up with something that's got longitudinal follow up um, instead of cross sectional and preferably one that's got archived samples, such as a randomized double-blind placebo-controlled trial. Does that yeah, make sense? Great. Yeah, no, great, great response. I think it really strengthens like how, you know, how our trainees should be thinking about 
justifying and and looking at their own individual studies. So thank you. Thank you. Thanks. Yeah, along those lines, what about the timing of the study for the exposure of animals? Because that always comes into question. It's like you're you're doing this based on you're not sure how long these pe these people, these patients are exposed. Um, you just assume like in some of these cases that it's been a while that they developed cancer or something. But yeah. how do you apply that to the human model? Like, I mean, yeah, so that's something that always comes up. So, you know, the mouse doesn't live as long as the human. And so how do you model, you know, 50, 60, 70, 80 years of exposures in a human and a mouse? And no one wants to wait the whole mouse lifespan of two years anyway. So do you give a higher dose than humans get, but for a shorter time? I mean, these are the arguments that I'm sure Chris heard even back when he was in training, you know, so it, and it comes back to what Dan was saying. So we we usually do in my lab a lot of 12 week studies for NASH just, just because that's kind of standard in the NASH field, uh, but no better reason than that. Probably the best approach to do um, if you got enough money uh, is to do serial imaging examinations, you know, MRI or uh, uh, CAT scan or uh, ultrasound, to, uh, um, or if you have a non invasive blood biomarker so you know when to stop your study. Like, uh, you know, we didn't know if you went longer, you, you might mice get cancer, you know, and so we've been missing that for years. So sometimes it's just luck. Got a question in the chat. Okay. Oh, Shesh, thanks for agreeing with the clinical trial design. Yeah. Okay. Um, Dr. Jala, um, can you correlate, comment on data that correlates with GI pro, uh, problems and liver problems? any association with environmental pollutants? So that's a fantastic question. And uh, um, much of liver disease, particularly alcohol-related liver disease, is believed to originate in the gut with intestinal permeability and le uh, leakage of uh, endotoxin uh, uh, to the liver, which increases liver inflammation and a variety of other responses. So. Um, uh, would really like to brag on you a little bit, uh, Jala, on some of the data that uh, that you've generated um, uh, with the uh, uh, on this area with uh, um, uh, dioxin like PCBs and TCDD. Um, so you've got some da great data showing that those disrupt intestinal barrier function, and uh, not only that, um, you're able to attenuate that with some of the uh, um, compounds that you've been developing um, in terms of the uh, AHR ligands, like from the pomegranate juice, the urolithins. And so uh, this is going to be, I think, a really neat thing that I want to work on with you and, and maybe with others. So it's a cool concept. So can you fight a bad AHR ligand with a good AHR ligand? So I call it fighting fire with fire. Um, and I will have to see how the reviewers think about that. Um, but uh, yeah, a lot of these diseases do st start in the gut. Um, just didn't have time to talk about everything. Um, Dr. Wolong has a good paper in the last year looking at microbiome and intestinal permeability there. So with uh, PCB exposures and um, importance of nuclear receptors, CAR and PXR on intestinal permeability and microbiome. So they're not just uh, receptors for drug metabolism. They regulate microbiome as well. It's a great question. Thank you. Okay, I think that's the end of the question, so we'll we'll stop here. Thank you, Dr. Cave. Thank you.